Second World War, started by Hitler's aggression against Poland, has spread throughout Europe. Norway, Denmark, Netherlands, and even the mighty France have fallen, reinforcing the image of an invincible German army. When all of Europe stood in shock and disbelief in the face of a crushing defeat, Poland kept fighting. Guerrilla units rallied in the countryside, and the Polish secret state was formed. Polish soldiers in the British Isles were getting ready to ward off the anticipated German invasion. In these difficult times, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill established a new organization, SOE, the Special Operations Executive. He tasked the newly formed command with one goal, set Europe ablaze. Special Operations Executive was ordered to perform a difficult task. It was supposed to manage and coordinate armed resistance throughout occupied Europe, including Poland. SOE was divided into national sections, each one training their own agents and moving them into the Nazi-occupied areas, where they joined and often took command of the local resistance movements. SOE supplied its agents and the local resistance with weapons, explosives, communications and other necessary equipment. Polish National Section was granted the highest degree of independence. Relations with SOE were handled by Unit 6 of the Staff Office of First Marshal of Poland. Unit 6 of the Polish Staff Office in England was tasked with maintaining constant communication with the Union of Armed Struggle Headquarters through radio and covert emissaries. Along with the SOE, Unit 6 managed the recruitment and training of agents, who were subsequently moved to Poland along with the necessary funds and equipment. Polish Home Army provided Unit 6 with reports on the current situation in Poland. Unit 6 relayed the intelligence to the staff office of the First Marshal. On November 28, 1939, General Sikorski sends a top-secret message to the Polish Army Command in the West. He orders the command to initiate selection process for a secret special ops unit. Candidates for super agents were expected to distinguish themselves with strong character, extraordinary courage and indomitable resolve. They needed to maintain cover under any circumstances and act as political and military emissaries within the occupied country. In May of 1941, the staff office of the First Marshal sends another order regarding the recruitment of the Silent Unseen. It is requested to immediately begin the recruitment for the Special Operations Unit. Requirements hereunder are to be followed according to the orders of the FM Staff Office. 1. Voluntary service. 2. Impeccable ideological and moral qualifications. 3. Strength of character and decision-making. 4. Organisational skills. 5. Civilian and military experience. 6. Military rank, from private up to colonel rank. 7. No age requirements, but fully able-bodied. 8. Knowledge of German or Russian is advised. These orders have reached the Polish army units scattered all over the world. At the same time, recruitment officers of Unit 6 have begun the search for suitable candidates in Great Britain and in the Middle East. They were called the Headhunters. Their actions were not well received by the frontline commands, who did not want to give up their best soldiers. However, the First Marshal's orders were carried out without objection. In what my case, they didn't ask. <laughs> it was a proposition. <laughs> I was summoned. <laughs> I had good, good <laughs> commanding <laughs> officers. <laughs> By their judgment, I was qualified. <laughs> and they asked no questions. Mam tutaj kwalifikacje i oni nic mnie pytali. Ja 
I think that they just looked through personal files and took whoever they considered qualified. The soldiers who managed to survive the invasion of Poland and broke through to the West, ultimately reaching Scotland, developed various attitudes towards the life abroad. Some enjoyed the stable and somewhat comfortable life among Scottish families, separated from the war, death and explosions, by the waters of the Canal La Manche, life felt good. They slowly started to assimilate, made friends and many found love. Some of the soldiers could not stand the inaction, apathy, boredom, constant coast patrols and anti-invasion training repeated over and over. The invasion was not coming. Being so far from the main theatre of war was affecting them. They knew that their homeland was fighting back against the invader and bleeding out. They wanted to act, to face their enemy. I remember that some colonel from London visited our company, our anti-tank division. And I was summoned into the company headquarters. And he gave me this option. Told me not to be guided by some false ambitions or anything like it. But said that there is a possibility of going back to Poland and asked me if I was interested. For some of the soldiers, being summoned by the command came as a surprise. Many of them were battling their thoughts. What did I do wrong? Speculations could be heard throughout the corridors, barracks and tents. There was no end to questions, especially considering that those who came back from being interviewed by the command remained dead silent. When the time came for each candidate, they stood before the old man with their hearts in their mouths. It was possible to resign at any time during the recruitment and training process. Such a decision carried no negative consequences. Only the best was suited for a power drop over occupied Poland. Those who decided not to jump served their country on different fronts, also fighting the enemy. And that was what really mattered. They simply observed and decided that I have these qualifications. Physically, I was in my peak. Besides, I knew German and some French. How could one join the ranks of the silent and seen? The officers of Unit 6 were looking for candidates within the army. They started by looking through the personnel files. When they decided on a candidate, they summoned him for an interview. After some time, the silent unseen started to recommend their friends and colleagues. There were cases of Unit 6 officers themselves stumbling upon their acquaintances and then convincing them to join the service. And so rumour spread about those who disappeared from their units, silent and unseen, the parachutes. Before the candidate was officially recruited, he needed to pass an interview, either with Unit 6 officers or with the Colonel Major directly. At the beginning of the interview, candidates were notified that the subject of their conversation had to remain confidential. The candidate had to sign a statement I volunteer to be delegated for service in the country. With this declaration, I vow to maintain secrecy. Right after, the recruiter asked, do you want to go back to the country? To the country? To Poland? How? When? 
Surely such thoughts raced across the soldiers' minds. Conversations like these, which determined whether the candidate was prepared to do anything that was necessary, were the beginning of a path for each and every of the silent unseen. It was a long path, paved with numerous training courses, fighting against own weaknesses, limitations and fears. Not many have reached the end, but those who did became highly skilled saboteurs, spies or communication officers. As the final step, they were parachuted into occupied Poland. At the time, I would have gone or flown anywhere. The garrison life in Scotland could go to hell. We were young, we wanted to do something. I would have consented to anything. Anyway, I agreed. The officer thanked me and that was it. Not long after that, I got the order. Following the interview, months have often passed before the candidate was sent out to receive their training. The transfer was often carried out during the night, quietly and in darkness. The same way in which the candidates return to the country after graduating all of their courses, as a silent unseen. Candidates for the Silent Unseen were required to complete a number of training courses, divided into several sections. The first step was the Commissionary course, also called Course Zero. The curriculum consisted of ground training in sabotage, demolitions and markmanship, as well as overall physical workouts. Course Zero was meant to assess the physical capabilities of the candidates, their psychological endurance and their aptitude for further training in sabotage and diversionary actions. The goal was to produce soldiers who were capable of operating independently within the occupied areas. It also laid the groundwork for further training in guerrilla warfare and diversionary operations in larger, organised assault teams. They put a lot of emphasis on physical condition. They were teasing us, standing at the foot of a tall mountain, saying, yesterday, the Norwegians reached the peak in five minutes. Let's see how you fare. Of course, they were just saying that. You needed 20 or 30 minutes to do it. It was 100 meters or 150 meters, but through ravines, through the forest, there was no road. If I remember correctly, it was two or three weeks. I certainly felt the difference. What's to say? It's not that I've grown a lot of muscle, but the readiness, the preparedness, how you saw your limits, you suddenly felt more capable. It makes a huge difference. The Polish Silent Unseen, among other SOE agents, received their instruction in specialised training centres scattered throughout England and Scotland. They were called the STS, Special Training Schools. Those located in northwestern Scotland were mainly used for the commissionary, diversionary and commando courses. The training lasted from a minimum of two weeks to as long as necessary. To make the most of the available time, the training took place from the early morning hours and lasted until dawn, often being stretched late into the night. Each day of training begun with an intense physical workout. The physical condition of the soldiers was being improved through cross-country running, as well as long-distance marches in both day and night time. The intensity of the training regime was being gradually increased, forcing the candidates to overcome their weaknesses. 
they were shown that they were able to push themselves much further than they had initially thought. It was like this all the time, regular obstacle courses. Go, as they say, cross country, not on the road, but cross country. It was important to have the spatial orientation, to reach the right spot. I think we did all of it in Scotland at that time. One of my friends, he was in charge of the group. I used to correct his azimuth angle references sometimes, because, you know, we had to reach our destination. My friend, he was in charge of the group of... I don't remember how many anymore. There were a few of us and we had to march from one place to another. I only remember that it was probably at night and I even somehow corrected this azimuth angle reference of his where he was leading us on a hunch. Azimuth marches were used to give the candidates an excellent sense of direction. They took place either during the day or in the night with or without the aid of a map and compass. The candidates were often driven far out into an unknown terrain, where they needed to determine their location and figure out a way back to base using only a map. In a different scenario, the candidates were left in a previously visited area and had to return to base without using a map or a compass. All of these exercises were aimed to develop necessary habits for precise and effective navigation, even in an unknown terrain, both individually and as a group, and regardless of weather or light conditions. They improved the soldiers' stamina and self-confidence, teaching them to trust their training. They developed the ability to act independently, make quick decisions and work as a team. There was this fence constructed of some iron bars. And if you wanted to go somewhere, it was best to jump over it. There were guys of various age, some of them a little older, so they didn't always succeed. Me, being the age that I was at the time, it would be hard for me not to be at my peak. To jump from a first floor window was no big deal, right? I don't remember whether we had to, but I, for one, used to do it. Maybe not every day, but I did jump to find out what I was capable of. Whether we had to jump from that first floor, but it was no big deal. If you hang down, it's not first story anymore. I had no problem with climbing up either. I went over the fence, there were these ledges and then I could climb up. It was first floor. Other elements of physical training included upper body training, also called rope work. After completing this course, climbing, ascending or traversing a rope seemed easy as pie. Proper landing technique from various heights, also called tumbling. The candidates were taught proper rolls and breakfalls. It was supposed to prepare them physically and mentally for the difficulties of parachuting. Another element of training was the ability to traverse various obstacles, both natural and man-made. It started with a jump from a first story window. From there, one had to climb a rope, and then I don't remember the exact order. There was crawling down under some metal sheets, walking on ropes between some trees. At the end there was... The route was running towards the sea. There we had to rappel down, not down to the beach, but on the coast. And the last obstacle was a kind of a plank laid over a ditch. <clears throat> when you went over it, they detonated some kind of explosive. It was loud. 
to see whether you'd lose your balance or something. It was that kind of training. Gestapo! One of the most challenging elements of the physical training was running an obstacle course. The course started with an instructor barging into a room shouting a Gestapo, after which the candidate had to jump out of a first story window. In a continuous dash, the candidate had to traverse various obstacles, both natural and those set up by the instructors. At the final stage of diversionary training, the obstacle course included the objective to shoot a number of targets, placed along the route. Graduating the physical training course required the candidates to demonstrate extraordinary determination, endurance, physical prowess and mental toughness. However, this course was only one of many elements of training, which the future air troops still needed to go through. Other courses included marksmanship, demolitions, communications, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and numerous other skills indispensable to the silent unseen in their future exploits. The candidate who wished to become a silent unseen had to graduate a number of grueling courses. The main ones were diversion, demolitions, marksmanship and physical training. The last one was accompanied by an intensive hand-to-hand -hand combat course, which could be extended to encompass knife fighting. The candidate needed to acquire a high degree of proficiency in these skills, which were necessary for diversionary action. The focus was on teaching the soldiers a set of simple, effective techniques for offensive and defensive purposes during special operations. The course, which was officially called Close Combat, was dubbed by the candidates as... Instructors, at least those I knew, there were two of them, they were huge, huge men. To whom I could not stand up to physically, not at all. There was one I remember. He was built like a bull. He did train hand to hand combat. So, you know, when he grabbed me, I certainly did see some stars. Such were these gentlemen. <laughs> the system of hand-to-hand -hand combat taught in the SOE training centers was simple, brutal and effective. The instructors worked under the assumption that attack is always quicker than the defense. Thus it was the offensive skills that were given priority in training. The future commandos were taught techniques forbidden in sport. They were shown vital points of the opponent's body that were most susceptible to an attack. Training methods were meant to develop a tenacious fighting spirit. The goal was to react quickly and eliminate the threat. The bodies of the silent unseen were being turned into weapons. The combat system used in training was developed by Fairbarn and Sykes. Their students, mainly policemen from the colonies, were transferred to England for the particular purpose of teaching the art of silent killing. Physical training and hand-to-hand -hand combat, different blocks, ways to incapacitate or kill. Dad told me that they were learning jujitsu. He demonstrated some locks, throws, breakfalls. He was good at it. Even when he tripped, one could see how proficient he was. He demonstrated various techniques he was taught. A different technique to incapacitate and a different one to kill. According to the objectives of the Fairbarn psych system, simple elements were taught first and then developed into combinations and more complex movements. 
Techniques were selected on the basis of their effectiveness, ability to attack from every angle, and the time needed to acquire proficiency. Theory was limited to absolute minimum, focusing on practice. Initially, the candidates were taught knife hand strikes, targeting opponents' vital areas. Subsequently, they were taught palm strikes, knee strikes, low kicks and stomps, along with boxing techniques, choke holds, joint locks and takedowns. A silent unseen was supposed to strike quickly and aggressively to gain an upper hand, even against a larger and heavier opponent. These are the daggers, the ones we used for stabbing, like this. Or otherwise, it might not penetrate. There could be clothes, a coat, anything else. They even cut through the scabbards. We were shown, we were shown, yes, not with the sharp ones, but with blunt ones. We had to draw the knife and strike. We struck, but not with the sharp ones, that was impossible. But when the blade was dull, then you could have sparred with it, fight with it. Dad told me that knife fighting was taught by an actual knifer, a street cutthroat, a typical thug. He told me what this knife fighting was all about. It was about cutting the opponent and making the enemy bleed out. Not about looking for a final blow, but dealing a lot of cuts. That's what this bandit had taught him. The one who was hired to serve in the army and to train the silent unseen. Fairbarn and Sykes, the fathers of the military combat system, went as far as to develop a special kind of dagger, designed especially for close quarters fighting. It was used by SOE agents, the Silent Unseen, and commandos throughout the course of World War II. Both the experts had a lot of respect for the blade. They believed that the only fully effective way to defend against a knife attack was to use a firearm. The course is often stressed that engaging a knife-wielding opponent should be avoided. The soldier was supposed to evade and retreat. If this was impossible, the Silent Unseen could make use of the hand-to-hand -hand self defense techniques. But even then, he was strongly advised to utilize an improvised weapon. In the Fairbarn Sykes combat system, the dagger was mainly an offensive weapon, giving the wielder a huge advantage, both physical and psychological, over an unprepared, surprised opponent. For training purposes, short fragments of rope were used instead of actual blades. Wooden training knives were deemed too dangerous, causing unnecessary injuries, and rubber ones were very rare as majority of the rubber available was otherwise used by the war industry. The next stage of silent killing was acquiring the ability to disarm an opponent carrying a rifle or a sidearm. Disarming techniques were simple and effective. The main rule was to drill the chosen technique to perfection and utilize the element of surprise. Silent Unseen were taught to get out of the immediate line of fire, intercept the weapon, and incapacitate the enemy. Disarming techniques were supposed to prepare the candidates for unexpected scenarios, such as an arrest. As it turned out later, those were the skills that were going to save their lives numerous times. Another stage of silent killing were the open terrain operations. British command had an interesting approach towards the simulated combat. Using hand-to-hand -hand techniques was allowed, including even the most painful moves. However, the use of heavy objects and live ammunition was prohibited. There were strict rules against causing wounds or fracturing bones. It was an attempt to simulate the battlefield in as safe as possible manner. 
different scenarios were carried out, including assault and ambush operations. The training, apart from the fighting skills, imbued the candidates with a high self-confidence and the conviction that they could tackle even the most difficult tasks. My dad knew what to do with thugs. There was this one time where he knew that they wanted to beat him up, that they were ready. So there was only one way to beat them up first. He started with the closest one, and the rest got them. Well, they scattered. The exceptional proficiency in hand-to-hand -hand combat has proven itself useful multiple times, both in the battlefield and in private life after the war. The silent unseen have acquired skills, endurance and indefatigable resolve, which reinforced by the experiences of combat allowed them to handle life at its worst, overcoming even the most difficult of situations. Courage, awareness and fast reflexes were the fruits of a difficult training regime, which was supposed to prepare them to face the harsh reality of the occupied homeland.